Roberts are doing it. Um, I'm, I've been in contact with uh, T.K. Barber about doing a community Thanksgiving service, but we said we would probably, because their church is not meeting, um, they've not been meeting um, indoors at all live. They've been doing from outside and masked, and I don't know if they require proof of vaccination. But anyway, so we'll probably just record it, Tim and I, you know, just doing our thing, and then you can watch the community Thanksgiving service for what it's worth. So that's what looks like is happening for the community Thanksgiving service. The other thing is, um, uh, yesterday I went to the, the Buddhist temple, and there they required everyone to be masked the entire time they were there, and uh, they wouldn't even let you in the door unless you could give them proof of vaccination. So they were running it differently. So I was wearing my mask there with the Buddhists um, for a good part of the day, and I got so used to having it on that I took a break. And you know what I did? I, something's the matter. It didn't want to go. So anyway, what we're doing at our church, I think, is a good middle of the road. We're trying to be skillful and wise, but but. Um, not too afraid, but not too courageous either, trying to get um, the right mix. So at council, we did pass that uh, in November. We're just going to keep doing like we're doing, but we would ask that you be vaccinated, and we would ask that you wear a mask. Of course, um, uh, this way we sit with people we know is good, but if you're with, you know, wash your hands, the usual stuff that all of you know. We might keep the babies safe. We want to keep one another safe. And so far, praise be to God, we've done really well. And as far as I know, nobody here at our church has infected another one um, by doing a church activity. And Maggie, with the youth, has done the same thing where they are, they are because they're young, they don't even have the ability to be vaccinated, but was requiring masking during the youth group gathering, which is on again, and, and to uh, my amazement, the report is that they are back in number. So we rejoice that they, they know that they need each other and love each other, and so it's a beautiful thing happening there with our youth. And we, I love you, Maggie. I thank you for that. So, are we ready to begin? All right, announcements, announcements. I got it. Yes, Kathy. Uh, since my husband's been retired, he has this new fascination with online auctions. And so I'm a gardener and I like to do uh, my soil, look at my soil test and all that sort of thing. So I said, hey, if you come across a microscope, let me know. He says, hey, I think we found one for you. Great. Puts a bid in. We win. I am now the proud owner of 20 microscopes. Oh. So it was a lot. <laughs> and so if any of you have kids or grandkids, these are from Anthony Wayne Schools. Um, there's, I think, four or five Bausch & Lomb microscopes that have the mirror for the light. And then the rest have electric lights to them. You can buy pre prepared slides at hobby stores and stuff for them. Uh, they didn't come with slides, but if if you have a kid that's interested in it and would like to have one, let me know. I, it's free. I will give it to you, no charge. So. Thank you, Kathy. How oh. remarkable. Uh, microscopes. John? After church in the parlor, Charles, Helen, and I are uh, putting on coffee hour, or as one of the parishioners used to call it, happy hour. Thank you so much. Howard, yes, Roger. I'd like to acknowledge my wife's extreme tolerance of me through 57 years of marriage. <laughs>
morning. Good morning. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, Zion, we were like those who dream. That our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. That it was said among the nation, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoice. Please join me in the invocation. <laughs> Jesus, send your Holy Spirit to help us as we give our hearts to you. We will serve and love thee above all. May our treasures always be found in our triumph of God. Amen. Please stand for our first hymn. Jesus' name. 
name. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together in unison. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God's words of kindness and hope enable us to walk with full sight. Read. 
And so this is uh, not how to read the hard parts. This is actually how to read one of the most easy and accessible parts of the Bible, and that would be uh, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So this is not really a, a good way to read First uh, Chronicles, uh, chapters 1 through 9, which is nine chapters of genealogies. Uh, this, is, um, this is how we read um, more like stories about Jesus. And there are many other places in the scriptures where you can use this methodology as well. This is similar to the idea where if you say, give a man a fish and he has a meal, teach a man to fish and he uh, you know, can eat for the rest of his life. So I want to say a little bit more about what I'm, what I'm promoting. There are um, considered in history, in both Judaism and Christianity, it may be in other religions as well, but there are, are different levels of understanding of a given scripture. And the first one is the historical or the literal level. And that would be where you read a Bible verse and you say, is it true? What was his name? Where did it happen? Could that be, you know, those kinds of questions. So uh, just, just the facts, you know, that kind of, uh, of understanding. And then the second one is to understand that the scripture often can be symbolic, allegorical, parabolic. So for example, the the story of Jonah and the whale. You can be thinking like, it's history. A whale can eat a man. That kind of thing. Or it could be symbolic. You could say, sometimes a whale, it's like a whale eating a man. Or it's like a whale eating me. You know, going to work today. It's been that bad. I feel like I've been swallowed by a whale. Or like I would say, um, when my beloved spouse is angry and doesn't talk for three days, I would call it three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. So it could be symbolic like that. And the third thing, it could be universal or moral, and this would be where you really investigate how the scripture applies to all the other scriptures. But, and the history and everything, how if you pull one string in this universe, it seems like you end up pulling the whole universe sooner or later. So the looking for a universal meaning. Um, or a moral meaning. And the fourth one is the one that we're approaching today, which is perhaps the most rare and, and yet quite precious, and that is a mystical understanding. And that's where somehow God speaks to your heart through the scriptures. Now some scriptures, this is easier for this to happen than others, and it is also not our doing. All we can do is be receptive. It's like you can take your radio, you can turn your radio on. Does anybody still listen to radios? Yes. Yeah. In your cars, probably. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it's like turning the radio on and turning it to the station. But maybe the station is not transmitting right now, so you don't hear anything. But if, it, you have the, if, you, if it's transmitting, you still need to turn the radio on. So the idea is that this is kind of like turning your soul on uh, to the scriptures and then seeing if God will speak to you through them. And I will say that, the, that there is a kind of like little word, in between word, big word kind of experience. A little word is like where you go like, yeah, I think I felt a little something there. Or yeah, there might have been a little bit of an idea there. Or maybe the, you know, the word Bartimaeus you know, came out to me. Hmm. Uh, or it could be the middle one, like, whoa, whoa, or it could be just be like mind-blowing, where it's like your life has changed because you just uh, heard scripture in a way that God really spoke to you, okay? So, expect anything can happen. Likelihood is very little will happen, okay? Because that's usually the way it is. Just like every time you sit down for a meal, it's not the best meal you've had in your life, but it's still a meal. So still eat. And so this is a, is a practice of, uh, of uh, being available to God. So here are the four steps. And I added a fifth one. And you might say, who is that island to add a fifth step to Lectio Divina, which has been around for a thousand years? Who do I think I am? Well, what I am is I'm a pastor, and I'm just trying to, to overcome two typical problems that come from mysticism. But here we go. I have the text in front of you. You can see it in the bottom of your page. It is Mark 10. It's the story of the healing of the son of Timothy, who was a blind man, who called out to Jesus. So that's the story that we're going to, to look at today. 
And this is the process. So slow down, calm down, relax, become receptive. So let's just take a moment and do that very thing. Because we can be very noisy in our heads with other dreams and other thoughts and it's hard to put them aside and they jump in. It's like trying to talk and listen in a crowded restaurant when everyone's all around you and it's so loud you can't hear. This is like turning down your hearing aids so you can't hear all that noise. You can pray, I'm as ready as I am. God, speak to me as you wish. And this is because you're not going to be perfectly ready but you can be as ready as you are right now. The next thing is when we do read the text, to read it slowly. And uh, I'm going to actually read the text out loud and uh, let you hear it as well as read it. But you don't think the text. This is not um, a first level historical literal interpretation. This is not even necessarily a second level symbolic, allegorical, parabolic, and this is certainly not something we have time to go into the universal applications and connections with all things. This is a mystical reading. So it's something that's more felt than thought. So think about what is the, the feeling, uh, the, the light of this text when you read it, reading it slowly in a receptive way. Another thing and it is that in a text like this one that involves people and walking and things is to, um, to take a perspective and to put yourself in it. Uh, whereas uh, John Climacticus came up with the four rules for, um, for Lectio Divina, it was Ignatius de Leola who described how to really put yourself in the text. Think about what you would see, what you would hear, what you would feel, what you would taste, what you would see. Well, really enter yourself into the story. And secondly, Ignatius of Leola uh, said that you can you pick a perspective. So when you read this text, think you could take the perspective of Jesus. What it was? What did Jesus see? What did Jesus hear? What did Jesus feel? What did Jesus smell and taste? Or you could pick the blind man, Bartimaeus. What did he see? Well, nothing. But when he did see, what did he see? And what did he hear? And what did he feel? Or you could pick one of the disciples, a man or a woman. Now, what did she experience as a follower of Jesus here at this moment? Or a man, or an onlooker who has knows nothing about Jesus but is just there. Or you could pick a child. My point is, pick a, good, a, a set um, perspective and, and play with it. Go ahead and be there and imagine yourself there and then see what emerges. Then after that's done, you sit with it silently and you try to think what you've gotten from this. If you want to write things down, the back of the, of the paper is those writing type people. You can write down, I got nothing out of this. This makes no sense to me. Pastor Ed wasted my Sunday. I wish I'd stayed home. You can write that if you want. Or you can write, First thing Bartimaeus saw when he opened his eyes must have been <sighs> okay. So whatever it is that you what you get from this, and then um, and then to rest, just gently be in that sense of uh, connection with God, and then I'll go to discernment um, um, because discernment is that once in a while when people read the Bible they really mess up their life because they've got no discernment. An example of that, the, the traditional pastor story is the man said, I want to go get guidance from God. So he pops the Bible open, he puts his finger down and says, Judas went out and hung himself. So he says, that can't be right. So he closes the Bible, pops it open again, puts down his finger and says, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> So he opens the Bible, um, pops it open again, says, what thou doest, do quickly. And he kills himself, which is a, a horrible thing. A horrible, horrible, horrible thing. But the point is, when, whenever mysticism is involved, or direct connection with God, there's two places people typically go wrong. One is they mistake the voice of God for their biggest fear. It's, like, it's called like the end. 
And that means like you're on the edge of a building and something inside of you says, you know, you can jump off. That's, that's not a good thought. But don't think that's God. So that's where discernment comes in, where you, where you get a, a, a thought that harms you or harms someone else. It's probably not God, so you need discernment. And that's where it comes in to like talk to other people, study further. And the other one is the grandiose thing. And that is where you feel like God has spoken to you and then that makes you super special and better than everybody else and you now become the next prophet, the second coming of Christ or something. And so we get people that make that mistake too. And I have to say, sadly, I've seen that as well. And so there's, there, so this is why discernment I have added as a fifth step. Because uh, when you've done this, you're not done. You live the rest of your life and you have to live with other people. And, um, and so it has to make sense. So one of the ways you can do that is by, if you get this insight, you can take it to someone that you know or trust, and you can say, hey, I got this, and I, this is what I got. And the person goes, wow, that's cool, that's beautiful, I'm never going to forget that, that's amazing. Or they can say, what are you talking about? So it's a, it's a way that we help each other uh, stay on the trail. So you're ready? Pick up your papers, look at, the, look at the verse, and listen to me as I read it, first of all. Pick a perspective, Jesus, Apostle, somebody. Enter the whole thing. We'll start with a moment of being calm. God, we are calming down. We invite you to speak and dance, to speak with each of us as you see fit through the reading of this scripture. May you come alive to us in our hearts. We're as ready as we're going to be, as quiet as we're going to be. Help us, Lord. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly Son of David, have mercy on me.
Get up. <coughs> he is calling you. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? Teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Did anything come out to you? How many of you, for example, you don't have to raise your hand, but were thinking as if you were Bartimaeus, the blind one, what that was like for him to overcome people saying, shut up, and then throwing off his cloak, jumping up. How many have thought that like what it was like to be Bartimaeus. How many of you wondered what it was like to be Jesus? People calling out to him all the time. Beggars everywhere. It's like going to a like downtown Ann Arbor where all the they were out on the streets. Um, we got a few people on street corners, but nothing like a third world countries. Like God have mercy on those missionaries and Beggars are out there. Beggars everywhere. What was it like to be Jesus? Why did Jesus ask, what do you want me to do? What do you think if you were one of the disciples, a woman, who have traveled with Jesus, one of the hidden ones in the New Testament, who was always there, saw everything, but wasn't reported on, the one place where they report on the women is when they are at the cross. They do not abandon Jesus at the cross. The women stay with Jesus at the cross. When the men run off, that's the one place where they talk about the women. But the women were always there. How did you see it if you saw this as a woman? Or an onlooker, or even as a child. These are all different perspectives. You could live with this verse for a long time, this, these verses, if you want to. And you might find that this felt like 
Eh, that wasn't too bad. It's like watching the sunset. A little quiet, a little pleasant. Maybe I got a little insight. Or maybe it was more than that for you. But this is how um, sacred reading works. You let yourself really experience the scripture. Now an example of this, for example, from Philema Herrits in her book, is she was, um, for example, contemplating the wedding feast of Cana. And she was changing work from one job to another. And the thing was, the wine has run out. And she realized the wine of her life had run out. There, there she is. Yes. Beautiful. The, the wine has run out. In other words, it wasn't just about Jesus back then. It was about her life then and there. The wine had run out in her life, and it was time for Jesus to make some new wine. It was time for her to change jobs. It was time for her to move on. So there's ways that this can, can speak to an actual circumstance in your life. That's why discernment's important, because um, it could be that you're, you're just cooking stuff up yourself, and, it's, and you shouldn't like leave your job or, or something like that. So it's, it's not something to just jump at the first time you see a little light. But that doesn't mean that the light isn't real. I have had um, scriptures that I have read for my whole life, uh, seriously read and studied, and then just uh, like this last year, one of the scriptures just popped for me and came alive. It was like the floor fell off of it, and I see it in a new way. And I will never, ever be able to read that scripture again without having had that experience of, of, uh, of awakening or enlightening or like God speaking through it. So how about you? I was talking to a bunch of ministers, because I'm dean of mommy clergy, and ministers get together and they often do this thing like, churches nowadays, <laughs> right? They aren't the way churches used to be. And the, and the idea was like, people ought to like pray at home and not just do the stuff at church. And you know, okay. So um, I wish now that I had, I had asked them, well, what do you do in your home? What do you do in your home? Uh, and so uh, it's it's um, so this is this is me sharing with you how to do lectio divina. Um, so this is something you can do in your home. Now I'm going to recommend that if you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. I mean, nobody's keeping score here. You can do whatever you want. But if you want to do it, there are some easier starting places than others. And um, I highly recommend the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the story of the life of Jesus, because Jesus' life is the, is the orientation for us, the perspective of us about who God is and who we are and how we are to be together. Now, in terms of which one to pick, if you want to pick one, if you like... Uh, Things to all fit and make sense like a puzzle, then Matthew is your man. Matthew is the one who really tries to show how the gospel fits together and, and with the, the Jewish law. And then if you really like it just like, just the facts, man, just the facts, plain and simple, then Mark is the one for you. It's the shortest and it's the, the, the most direct, if, if, if I may say. And then if you like, if you think that we really ought to be about caring for the poor and the oppressed, and that, uh, it's a, that the following God is very much a justice thing, then Luke brings that out more than anyone else. And I would recommend that you read the Gospel according to Luke, and you will get all of the helping for the poor that you need uh, to see. And if you believe in mystical union with God, that Jesus and God are united, and we are to be united with Jesus and God, and you have that mystical heart in you, you read the Gospel of John. So there you are. I, have, I hope that I have given you uh, something to do at home if you wish, and I hope that today, in some way, God did speak to you um, 
by bringing something a little bit up in your mind. So there's Lectio Divina, beautiful children of God. And when other people say, um, our church doesn't have any spiritual practices, you can say, well, our church does. We know how to do silent centering prayer, and we know how to read the Bible in a devotional way, in a mystical way. So here you have it. Um, blessed children of God. God's people say, Amen. Amen.
can't make it through your hand. Okay. Well, I'm praying for you, pal. There are not many of us left, and you're one of the strong ones, so <coughs> we just need you to recall. Is this your first back operation? One you've posted.